Glad to have you with us uh, this weekend, both on campus and those who are, are watching online. Believe it or not, this is our 36th week in the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, we still have more to go. Uh, by the way, I did want to say thank you so much on Father's Day to uh, uh, Pastor Jonathan and uh, last uh, Sunday to uh, Stephen Nichols for the incredible messages that they brought. How many are super grateful? Yeah, on serving and on flipping tables. So. Um, when I was uh, a, a college-age student and on spring break, we found very inexpensive ways to get to Florida. And, uh, and while we were there, it was spring training, so we decided that we would go watch uh, a, a baseball game. Of course, uh, college students don't have a lot of money, so we bought very cheap seats. But when we got there, we saw that there were actually a lot of very good seats a lot closer to the field. And so we uh, tried as inconspicuously as possible to move our way towards uh, the, those seats throughout the course of the game until we got some very nice seats. And it lasted just about a minute because someone came up and asked us if they could see our tickets. And of course, we were not where we were supposed to be. What right did we have to be there? And it turns out no right at all. Um, the question that Jesus gets asked is what right he has to be where he is and it's a fair question, and his response to that is actually the kind of things that is surprising. In fact, his words are so incredibly powerful that within just a few days he will be dead because of them. Uh, maybe you've said something that annoyed or angered someone. Uh, nothing to the extent that we're going to read that Jesus talked about today. In Matthew, the 21st chapter, it says Jesus entered the temple courts and while he was teaching, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? Remember, he just flipped the tables and cleaned out the temple. And who gave you this authority? And Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven? or of human origin. They discussed it among themselves and they said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we're afraid of the people for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Jesus had just cleaned out the temple. He'd upended some tables, and he quoted Old Testament passages that actually exposed the motives of the religious leadership in the actions that they were taking to gain economically from the interactions within the temple worship service. And when Jesus was done, people who were blind and people who were lame came to be healed, and children were even singing songs that were identifying him as being the Messiah. And the religious leaders were really ticked off by that, and they basically asked Jesus, what right do you have to do these things? And uh, they had asked that question before of Jesus, but it was more, what right, what authority do you heal people by? But now he had cleansed the temple. What gave you the right to do that? What gave you the right to drive out the money changers? And Jesus has this capacity to ask a question, and the point is not to change the subject. He's not doing that. He's narrowing in on the question. And he said, I'm happy to answer your question if you'll answer mine. And it has to do with John the baptizer. Was his baptism, was that from heaven or was that of human origin? He's not changing the topic. John is the one who announced that he was coming, and John is the one who identified him as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. And what Jesus is basically saying is if you don't recognize John, you're probably not going to recognize me. And if you can't assess his ministry, there's no way you can assess mine. So they're caught. And the reason they're caught is because they do have an opinion about John's ministry. They believe it's completely human. But they're afraid to say that because they knew the popular opinion was that John was a prophet. Isn't this interesting? The very people who seem to present themselves as being the bold voice of God, not backing down to anyone, have a lot of things they won't say when they perceive the crowd is behind it. And they, they play this uh, almost a uh, uh, an agnostic game. And agnosticism says, well, I don't have enough information to give an answer about God. That's what they say about John. 
We just don't know. We don't know. And what Jesus points out to them is uh, you lack integrity. You do have an opinion about this. You won't speak up. If you can't assess his ministry, you really will struggle with mine. And then Jesus does something very much like Jesus. He tells three parables to drive home his question, what gives you the right? You ask me, what rights do I have? What gives you the right? Parable one, what do you think? I like that, right? He's asking them to actually think about something. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the other son and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. And Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, <laughs> this is, he starts really getting under their skin now. Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Jesus wants them to know. He's, he's basically asking the question, you did nothing. Who gave you the right to do nothing? Uh, interesting. How many have heard the word idiot? How many have been called an idiot? How many have used the word idiot to describe somebody else? If you think about the word, the way we define the word idiot, it means not a very smart person. All right. Whenever we use that, uh, have you ever noticed that someone who's driving slower than you is an idiot? They just are. And, uh, so we, we kind of go like that. The original meaning of that word, which comes from the Greek language, is not stupid. The original meaning was that there were people who were, they were political leaders, uh, like senators and things like that. And then there were people who were not political leaders. And the people who were not political leaders, but also not doing anything for public life or public service, the word that they used to describe that was a word that we think of for like apathy or disconnected or not interested. And in Greek, that's idiotos. So what, what we have come to define people as stupid back in the Greek language was just, you're not engaged, you're not interested, you're apathetic. And Jesus is asking, what gives you the right to be an idiot? What gives you the right to be disengaged? What gives you the right to be apathetic? Here's John the Baptist, and he's out preaching the gospel. And there are people who you despise, people who are, are tax collectors. And some tax collectors were known to, to extort people in order to get more for themselves. And, and people involved in the, in the sex trafficking industry, they were coming to repentance. And he said, you saw that those people were attracted to the gospel, and they were repenting. And you sat by and did absolutely nothing. You had developed a religion that basically says our job is to steer clear of people like that. And John shows that our faith is actually designed to call people like that to a place where their lives can be changed. And when you saw that life change, you did nothing. Who gives you the right to do nothing when you're seeing what God is doing? That didn't land very well. Now, when it comes to this, there are some people who say, well, the church should be accepting of everyone, and we should. But then there are some people who say acceptance means that, that there's no change that happens in their life. That's not true. Grace always accepts us as we are, but grace never leaves us as we are. How many are glad God's still working on you? Yeah? He's still working on us. And so these people were coming but they were hearing something that changed the way they thought, and then it changed their behavior. 
Some people think repentance is all about how bad you feel, regret and remorse. Regret will not change a person's behavior. Repentance does. Okay. So they repented, they believed. They were baptized. And, and, and then Jesus, he's made his point. He's got point number two. He's a good preacher. He's going to have three points. Uh, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and he put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and put a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time. And the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. And they will respect my son, he said. But then the tenants saw the son and they said to each other, this is the heir, come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at the harvest time. And Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? And he's going to quote out of Psalm 118, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. And it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Jesus tells another parable, and it raises another question about what rights do you have? Who gave you the right to be self-serving? He tells a story about a king who, who goes in, he plants a vineyard, and then he digs out a wine press so that you can produce the, take the grapes and, and produce wine. He built a wall around the vineyard so that wild animals would not be able to get in. He puts a watchtower up so that they can keep watch in case someone comes in and tries to take uh, their produce inappropriately. And he does all of this at his own expense and then he turns it over. He rents it out to a group of tenants, farmers, who are going to keep this for him. And what they get to do is they get to keep a lot of the produce. They get to keep a lot of the, the results of, of their effort, their work. But he does say that when I come back, there's a portion of fruit, there's a portion of wine that's supposed to come back to me. And so he sends his servants to collect and, and they just abused the servants and even killed one of them. And so the, 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 the farmer, the landowner, he says, well, I'll send more servants. So he sends more servants. They do the exact same thing. Finally, he says, I'll send my son. Certainly they will respect my son. And this is a really fascinating passage because Jesus is actually making a declaration here. I'm not just a messenger that's sent. I'm the son. And he predicts what's going to happen. They're going to throw him out of the vineyard. And they're going to kill him. And they're going to think that they get to keep all of this for themselves. In Jesus' parables, the vineyard always represents Israel. The, the, the walls represent protection. The servants represent prophets that come and, get, and give messages. And, 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 and the son represents Jesus. And they kill the son in the story. And so what is the response of the, the landowner? And he asks, Jesus asks them, what do you think is going to happen? They said, well, the landowner's not going to like that. He's, he's going to come and deal very powerfully with them. And in fact, there are some people who believe that Jesus is now predicting the destruction of Jerusalem. Theologians and Bible commentaries predict that the language that he uses is exactly what happens in 70 AD. And he, and he says, I will take this from you and I will give it to someone who will produce fruit. 
He refers to Psalm 118 about the stone that other people reject, but it's going to hold everything together and it's going to be marvelous in everyone's eyes. This idea of a stone is a really important theme that runs through the Old Testament. In Isaiah 8, it says that this way, it says, the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He is the one you are to fear. He is the one you are to dread. He will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah, and he will be, listen to it, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Jesus is saying, I'm the stone you're stumbling over right now. Isaiah would also put it this way. He would say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. The one who relies on it will never be stricken with panic. Jesus is saying he's the stone that is precious, that is tested, that is sure. Even in the Old Testament, there's a great story in the book of, of Daniel. Uh, there's a king and he had a dream and he couldn't remember it. How many of that's happened to you? Yeah. Uh, in, in a dream the other night, I told myself a joke and I didn't get it. <laughs> and I had to explain it to myself. And then I woke up and my wife asked me, what was the joke? And I don't remember it. I'm sure if you're in psychology, you can gather a lot of information from that. Okay. So, so this king has a dream he can't remember, but he knows it's significant. And so he calls all of his wise men and his magi together. And he says, he says, I had a dream. I don't remember it. I want you to tell me what it is and what it means. Go. And they said, that can't be done. And he said, okay, I had a dream. I can't remember it. I want you to tell me what it is. And I want you to tell me what it means. And if you don't, you will die. And they said, it still can't be done. And, and he gives the execution order, and Daniel actually says, just if you can hold off on that order, give me a little bit of time to pray, and maybe God will help us. And he prays, and God shows him the dream, and God shows him the meaning. And, and the dream is kind of interesting, as dreams often are, right? That there's this, the, the, the symbol, uh, symbols of things. And, and so there was this giant statue, and, and the head was made of gold, and the chest of silver, and the belly and the thighs were of bronze, and, and the legs were of iron, and, and the feet were a mixture of iron and clay. And there's this great statue, and then all of a sudden, the stone appears out of nowhere, and it strikes the statue right at the feet, and the whole thing begins to collapse until there's nothing but dust and, and rubble that's left. And then the stone grows really, really big and becomes a mountain. <laughs> and and when, when the king heard the, the dream, he says, yes, that's, that's the dream. How did you know that? And Daniel says, I'll tell you what it means. He says, every one of those things represent different kingdoms. So your kingdom is the head of gold. And after your kingdom will come another kingdom that will be silver. Still precious, but not quite as valuable. And after that, there'll be, there'll be uh, uh, bronze, and then there'll be iron, and then iron and clay. And he said, and a stone will come, and it will put an end to all earthly kingdoms. And, and the king is quite impressed by all of this. But what Jesus is reminding the, the people that he's talking to, because this concept of a stone runs strong in Jewish theology. What he's saying, I'm the thing that you're tripping over. I'm the thing that's causing you to stumble. But I'm the thing that holds things together. And I have come to undo all the kingdoms of this world so that God's kingdom can be established in our lives and in our world. And in fact, in the Hebrew language, it's really interesting. In the Hebrew language, the, the word son is ben, B-E-N. The word for stone is eben, E-B-E-N. And what Jesus is doing is a word play. You are rejecting the son, but I am the stone that will hold everything together. And, and that doesn't go very well with these guys. They immediately want to have him arrested and killed. What he's saying is this. What he's saying is this. Is that you have rejected. You have done nothing. You are disloyal. You are taking the benefits that come. You don't share them with anybody else. And then he goes to a third parable, third point of Jesus. And it's in Matthew 22. And 
And so now he, wa he wanted to know who, who gave you the right to be self-serving. Take all of this upon yourself and keep it. Then Jesus spoke to them again in parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent servants to, to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. And then he sent more servants and said, tell those who have been invited, I, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off to his field, another to his business. And they, the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. And the king was enraged, and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite the bank to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. And he asked, how did, how did you get in here without any wedding clothes, friend? And the man was speechless. And then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Many are invited, few are chosen. Last question that Jesus asks, first one, who gives you the right to do nothing? Second one, who gave you the right to be self-serving? Third one, who gave you the right to be here? It's a great question. Who's welcome and who's unwelcome? The king had prepared a wedding banquet for his son. It was a big deal. And he sent out the kind of like save the date idea. Just let everybody know this is coming. And then the, the moment comes and he sends out the information and they've all got other things that they want to do. And when the servants came and tried to cajole them into the banquet, uh, they treated them very badly and uh, in, in some cases even killed them. And so the king eventually sent an army, destroyed these murderers and burned down their city. Once again, a reference to what will happen in 70 AD. But what's interesting is he says, go out and find, we're going to fill this hall. We are going to have a party. And, and they go out, the servants go out and they find uh, both the bad and the good. And the hall is filled and the king comes in and everybody's thrilled to be there. And, and then he notices one guy not wearing wedding clothes. Oh, what is this? And it's really interesting. In the ancient world, and there's lots of references to this in the Old Testament, but in the ancient world, if you were a wealthy king, one of the things that you would do when you would have like a banquet like this is not only would you provide food and you would provide drink, you would also provide clothing because the number of people who are actually considered wealthy in those days was a much smaller percentage than what we're used to seeing today. And they didn't want anyone to look bad or to be ashamed. They also didn't want anyone who had a lot to kind of exercise their pride. And so the wealthy kings would provide a wedding, we'll call it a costume. It's what you wore. And so the king comes in and there's one person just kind of standing out. He's, he's not wearing. So why would you do that? Because everyone was invited and everyone was given food and everyone was given drink and everyone was getting given wedding garments. Why did he, why did he not choose to put on the wedding garment? And the answer is because he liked what he was wearing better. He just did. He looked at himself in a mirror and he goes, I like how that looks. He looked at the wedding garment and he said, it's not my color. Makes me look fat. Well, he stood out like a sore thumb. And uh, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. He stands out like a sore thumb. What is he saying? What I'm wearing is good enough. And you have to accept me on those terms. And what Jesus is saying is, no matter how wealthy we think we are in, in our own righteousness, it's never good enough. We're not perfect. 
We have flaws, we have faults, we have failures. And when they're called to our attention, we don't always manage that really well. And the great problem for people regarding Christianity is just basically this simple truth. They're offended to hear that my righteousness is not enough. I'm a good person. I've done some good things. I've helped some people. I've worked hard. I've taken care of my family. And God doesn't say any of that is not true. And God doesn't say any of that is bad. God just says it's, it's not enough. The prophet Isaiah would also make reference to our garments of righteousness, self-righteousness, are as filthy rags before God. But listen to what else the prophet Isaiah would say in Isaiah 61. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. It doesn't matter whether we thought we were good or we thought we were bad. We've been invited to the party that God is throwing and he has put on robes of righteousness for us so that every single one of us have been made acceptable to him in his kingdom and in his sight. Is there anybody else in the room who thinks that's really good news. It's amazing news. Unless you think you're good enough. And when you think you're good enough, you just don't go, well, that's what they think. Something else happens. And you decide that people like that need to be silenced. And with only a matter of days of Jesus asking these three questions of these religious leaders, he'd be crucified on a cross. The, the question that I have for you are the questions of Jesus. Are you just an observer to what God is doing in the world? What well, gives you the right to disengage? Are you a beneficiary of the goodness of God? And are you willing to share back with God and others what he has done for you? Or do you just see this as an opportunity to gather even more? Are you in the kingdom of God or in the house of God just simply because you think you're good enough? Or are you willing to acknowledge that he has provided the robes of righteousness that we so desperately need? And I can tell you right now, if those questions offend you, it says something about what's going on inside of you. But for those of us who consider it a privilege to be engaged in the work that God is doing, not just a responsibility, to be able to share something back because he's been so generous with us, to be able to, to enter into a place unashamed and without pride because of what God has done for us rather than what we has done for him. That's a source of incredible joy. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, there are some people who wonder what right they have to be in this room today because they see their faults and they see their failures. Would you help them know that you have invited them to this party and you have paid the price and you have a robe of righteousness you want to clothe them with and that they need never be ashamed. This is the stone that some people stumble over, but it's the foundation that holds everything together. And what you have done is marvelous. It's marvelous in our eyes. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.